I would like to welcome you at a very special uh, session of our regular Monday seminar. Uh, it's actually um, one lecture of the series of the of, uh, of Fred Jelinek series of lectures, which we um, started right after uh, Fred Jelinek passed away. And we invite every year, every academic year, uh, two, one, two of professors, uh, distinguished professors, to give a talk in this series. And it's really an honor for me to welcome this time Professor William Croft uh, to give a talk uh, at this occasion. Um, Professor uh, Croft is uh, one of the most prominent uh, uh, researchers uh, in, uh, I would say, in typology of languages, interested in semantics and in the meaning and understanding of language. Um, he wrote several books, actually, on different topics, but I think this was the leading idea, the understanding of language and uh, uh, typology, uh, the range of languages uh, of the world. Just to uh, quote some titles of your books, uh, Cognitive Linguistics was one of them, Typology and Universals, and uh, Construction Grammar, Radical Construction uh, construction Grammar, and Explaining Language Change, I should not forget that one, and the Verb Aspect uh, Structures. Maybe more, but I have a note of these, uh, of these five. And um, uh, the, uh, what we really, I mean, we, I say we, I mean uh, people in dependency linguistics uh, uh, welcome very much uh, was the fact that Professor uh, William Croft got interested in the, well, I would say fashionable, uh, but I don't want to say fashionable, mm -hmm. uh, really, uh, the uh, tendency to build uh, uh, universal uh, dependencies and I welcome this especially for the fact that a true linguist is now engaged not really in this project but but uh, uh, just uh, has his words to uh, comment upon this project and I hope that the talk today will be one of the occasions to drop some words on these projects in uh, one special area. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, I'd like to thank uh, Jan and Eva for inviting me to this lecture series, and thank you all for coming to uh, today's talk. So as uh, Eva said, I'm a general linguist. I work in a number of areas, mainly semantics and then linguistic typology. That refers to looking at the diversity of uh, grammatical structures in the world's languages and trying to understand any kind of universal patterns that underlie them. These are always patterns of variation because languages are structurally very diverse. Um, and the first slides will explain to you how I got interested or involved uh, with the Universal Dependencies Project. As Eva said, I am just kind of a sympathetic outsider, but I've been welcomed by the or uh, leaders of the Universal Dependencies team, including people like Jan and Dan, wherever Dan is there. Um, so I have to use the, this thing over here to advance the slides. So let me say a little bit about this, because there's a third dimension here, which is how I got uh, interested in particular in universal dependencies, and that has to do with teaching syntax. So the first is the basic fact that we have to deal with as linguistic typologists who are trying to understand structural diversity of languages. And that is that language structures are incredibly diverse. And the joke they have in linguistic typology is the only exceptionless language universal is that all language universals have exceptions. So the kind of general patterns we look at are generally probabilistic. And I'll mention that as we go on to look at some specific examples. Oh yeah, got to go back here. Now why is this the case? The main reason why is that languages change. And languages change gradually. 
So if a language changes from one structural type or a particular construction in the language changes from one type to another, it's a gradual process and you'll find some languages that are in between, so to speak, and so they'll violate the more general patterns. Um, also, the other fact is that language is a, a general purpose communication system. We want to describe anything and everything, um, but we only have a, rel you know, a relatively small a number of words and constructions to do that. So we end up uh, employing constructions to express kind of odd meanings, and when that happens, the constructions end up changing meaning, and then they start looking like something you wouldn't expect. Nevertheless, for practical purposes, we have to carve up this continuum of language phenomena. Um, both as theoretical linguists interested in trying to understand the nature of linguistic diversity, even though we are aware of what's... <coughs> this thing working? Yeah. Even though we're aware of this fact about uh, gradualness and complexity of language uh, communication, we still have to divide up this continuum for various practical purposes. One of them is for computational linguistics applications. Another is for teaching uh, linguistic students at you know, the university level, the undergraduates, as we say in the United States, um, who have not seen syntax before. So typology can help us to do this in the least bad way. And what I mean by typology is the research that's been done that shows us what the patterns are, what are the common patterns what are the more exceptional patterns? You know, this is going to be arbitrary to some extent, but if we can at least sort of divide up the, the constructions of the world's languages in a way that where the exceptions are a, a small minority instead of you know, one third of the languages of the world, then we've done a, good, a better job. So um, I'm at the University of New Mexico. Uh, linguistic typology is done fairly widely in European linguistics departments in Australia. In the United States, it's still heavily dominated by Chomsky and generative grammar, uh, and there's only a small number of departments where typology is practiced, and not surprisingly, I'm at one of those departments. Um, one of the consequences of that is there aren't really any good textbooks. If you want to teach an undergraduate who hasn't done syntax before how to do syntax, and not just you know English syntax, as you would in America, but an analysis of English syntax from the perspective of what other languages in the world do or don't do, there just isn't anything. So I've had to develop something on my own. Um, I've taught, I taught in the UK as well as the United States in departments where um, the introductory syntax classes were taught by generative linguists, or at least not typologists. So I didn't have the opportunity to teach such a class until I moved to New Mexico when I was required to teach it and therefore had to find a way to do it. And so what I've been doing in effect, and basically once I uh, started getting involved a bit in computational linguistics again, what I started, what I did essentially was to teach my students to uh, annotate uh, the syntactic structure of English sentences and then sentences from other languages um, using a scheme which I, as a typologist, felt would be uh, useful, that they would not, it would not be a situation where in the first course the students would learn something about how to analyze English syntax, and then in the advanced course when they looked at other languages that I'd have to tell them, sorry, everything you learned was wrong, we have to start all over again. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so as it says here in the second bullet point, teach undergraduates to analyze syntactic structures so that they're performed, prepared to perform similar analyses in languages from around the world. And in fact, we actually get them to do that in that first uh, semester class, not just in an advanced class. So the goals are, are similar to the Universal Dependencies Project in Computational Linguistics, but the data is rather different because most universal dependencies are dealing with these tree banks, so these are going to be languages for which there's an extensive written tradition, and a lot of the written language has been digitized into corpora, and those corpora have been um, annotated in some way. Um, typologists 
are trying to maximize linguistic diversity. So typologists tend to use reference grammars written by linguists doing field work with small endangered language communities from all over the world. Um, so not the, not the kind of communities that have any digital resources. But it gives you greater diversity than you get just looking at major European languages, major East Asian languages, and maybe Arabic or Tamil or Hindi. So um, those of you who are familiar with the Universal Dependencies Project know that uh, Chris Manning at Stanford is one of the leaders of the, of the project. And he set some criteria. These are mostly practical criteria for what would make a good annotation scheme for syntactic dependencies uh, for computational purposes across languages. And that's what's on the left, and I'll go over them in a minute. That's where they are. And then on the, on the right-hand side is teaching undergraduates a typological approach to syntax so, and how much it's similar or the same. So the first one, it's satisfactory on linguistic analysis grounds for individual languages. So it should still do a good job of analyzing individual languages. Well, that's true, of course, for us as well, teaching syntax. Good for linguistic typology, brings out cross-linguistic parallelism. Again, that's the same goal that I have, teaching syntax. Suitable for rapid, consistent annotation by human annotators. Well, that's actually pretty comparable because as I said, this is a, for undergraduates. These are people who haven't done much syntax before. So you can think of them as a kind of people who are similar to computational linguistics undergraduates who are being uh, you know, employed on a project for annotating a corpus. Uh, probably a similar level of linguistic expertise. Suitable for computer parsing with high accuracy. Well, that's not applicable. Um, Easily comprehended and used by a non-linguist, non -linguist. and in particular, uh, Chris mentions relying on traditional grammar notions. And that's kind of true as well in uh, teaching syntax. Now, there is a debate in, ty among typologists about how much should we employ traditional terminology, which is going to have to be modified for describing languages all around the world, Africa, South America, or whatever. And I personally tend to be of the school that we shouldn't be always inventing new terms if the basic concept was captured by a traditional grammar term, but we do have to alter the, the meaning, the definition to uh, accommodate linguistic variation. So I'm closer to Manning's law, as they call it, than some other typologists who are, you know, prefer not to use some of that vocabulary. And clearly, there are cases where there are constructions that are rare or non-existent in European languages, so we don't have traditional terms for them. And then we do have to create new terms. But where there's something that's equivalent in a European language, I prefer to use the European grammar term. And for the same reason, it's, it's more comprehensible to my students and to other linguists who are trained in the European grammar, grammar traditions. And then the last one, support well downstream language understanding tasks. That doesn't apply in the teaching situation. So there are going to be some situations where uh, UD, the Universal Dependencies Project, will make choices that I wouldn't find useful for teaching purposes, but are useful for computational linguistic purposes. So the scheme, that, the annotation that I've developed, even though we've revised it, um, there's now actually a team of people at UNM team of instructors that I'm working with to, to refine it. And we are trying to make it as close to UD as possible, but there are going to be some differences. Um, it's possible that I might be able to persuade UD to change a little bit, but we'll see what happens. OK, now, in the field of typology, there is a, a central problem that you have to deal with, which is how do you compare the grammatical structure of languages. Remember, I started by saying language structures are incredibly diverse. So just because you use the same term to describe a construction in another language doesn't mean that it's really the same. And this has led to a big debate in the field uh, of typology. And I and Martin Hasselmatt, the German linguist, 
and another American linguist, Matthew Dreyer, is not mentioned here. The three of us have been pushing the view that's presented on this slide for quite a while now, as you can see from the dates on the papers. Um, so the issue is basically that any description, even if the terminology looks familiar to you from a, Euro, a European language, any description is, of a language construction is going to be language specific. So just because it's called a subject or called a noun in this other language, it's not means that it's the same as an English subject or an English noun. And that's because they're defined by language specific properties, facts about the grammatical constructions of that particular language. Um, so then we have to come up with a way of describing uh, language, uh, you know, coming up with a way to describe language structures across languages. And this has been done by typologists for 50 years, but it's only when Haslamat wrote that paper from 2010 that he used the term comparative concepts to describe and to just what we needed for language comparison and to distinguish them from the categories we use for describing individual languages. Um, so I picked up on that terminology and argued, uh, I could go, uh, you can ask me more if you want to know about this, but I hope you'll, this will, you'll see that there needs to be a different set of categories. So I took up his Haslamat's concept and argued that there's two kinds of um, comparative concepts that are important for cross-linguistic comparison and um, they're actually have been used without this, sometimes even with these terms for decades and it's not anything new or exciting in that sense. So constructions, which means any kind of grammatical structure to express a function. There will be an example on the next slide. Um, the strategy is a specific kind of grammatical form used to express that function, defined in such a way that you can compare them across languages. Um, so this is purely described in terms of the meaning or function that's expressed by a particular grammatical construction. And this is a, has to do with a particular grammatical form that's used. So examples on the next slide. So this is an example. It's actually taken from one of the universal dependency papers. Ivan is the best dancer in English, Russian equivalent, Ivan Luchitansor. So they both are the same construction. They have to do with the predication of an object concept, namely the concept of being a dancer and predicating it of some particular person. But there's two different strategies. In English, we have an inflected copula here, but in Russian, there is no copula. I forgot to check. Is, uh, is Czech the same as Russian in this respect? No? It's, that's more like English. Okay. So this is a way where we can compare uh, Russian has no copula. Uh, also, it does not inflect the object concept word. There are many languages in the world where the way you would say Ivan is the best dancer would be to inflect this with third person, singular subject, present tense. But Russian doesn't do that. So Czech is more like English. And so this means just looking at these three languages, we can just say with respect to this construction, English and Czech use the same strategy and Russian uses a different strategy. And you can define that without talking about specific categories of English or Czech. You simply say they both have a copula that's inflected. And um, I, we can define these carefully so that it doesn't make reference to anything specific about English or Czech. So that's the idea is that this is the construction of this function and then the strategies are two different linguistic forms for expressing that function. Two or more. I mean, obviously, languages have many more strategies. Another thing I don't say in the slides, but that's important, is that um, you can define your functions. You can distinguish one function from another, like predication of a property concept, like Ivan is tall. Um, Strategies are a bit harder to distinguish because remember I said languages change over time. They change their grammatical form. So you'll find a language that might have something which is sort of looks in between a copula and something else. And um, that's part of the kind of practical necessity. You know, in UD or in teaching syntax, you have to 
to draw a line and say these are copulas and these are not copulas. So first principle here is that constructions are by definition universal. Every language has a way of predicating object concepts and property concepts and so on. Strategies, however, are not universal. English uses a copula. It never uses a construction without a copula. Russian doesn't use a copula in the present tense. It does in other tenses. Um, so the first principle for developing universal tendencies, or for this, what I, I do in teaching, is that a universal annotation scheme should have a classification of constructions, not strategies, as its universal foundational layer. Because if you're trying to construct a scheme that you can apply to all languages, you start from the functions that, they, that all languages have to express, like predication. Um, on the other hand, there are common recurrent strategies that you will have to include, like you know, having a copula. Lots of languages do have a copula. So having a copula dependency or uh, some broader category of dependencies that includes copulas is desirable. Um, so UD has this principle, they call it the content word to content word dependency principle, um, which is if you want to make, if you want to construct your analysis, you should try to link the content words. So in the previous example, it would be Ivan and Dancer. I'm sorry I didn't make a slide with dependencies for that, but you would have a link between Dancer as the predicate and Ivan as the subject, and the copula would not be there or would be in a small, a lower dependency because not every language has a copula. And so then English and Russian dependencies would look pretty similar because they both have Ivan and Dancer as content words. And so when I saw this principle, when I started reading the universal dependency art papers, I realized that they, had, you know, that UD is, from a typological perspective, is on the right track because these little function words tend to come as go, and if you make your grammatical constructions, uh, put them high in your dependency tree, you're gonna be stuck when you go to another language and it doesn't have that function word. So that means the topology of the dependency trees are basically fine from this typological universal point of view. I mean, there's not, we might disagree about how to label the dependencies, but on the whole, the topology of the dependency tree would look the same, whether you're a typologist or a UD computational linguist. That's very critical to get the basic topology right, because otherwise you'll never be able to reconcile these two. Okay, so now there's another dimension. <clears throat> and I should say, I, there's, uh, when I wrote a paper about this that was in the TLT co uh, workshop papers from last year. I have four principles about applying uh, typology to UD for constructing UD. I'm only going to talk about the first two in this talk because I want to talk mostly about another important issue. So this will be a lead up for the second one. And that is this notion of semantics and information packaging. Um, and this comes from work research I did that goes all the way back to my uh, dissertation work 30 years ago. Um, that is parts of speech, like noun, verb, and adjective. These pose extremely vexing problems for cross-linguistic analysis. And if you don't believe me, just go to the Universal Dependencies website and carefully read the criteria for noun, verb, and adjective and see how different and inconsistent and confusing they are. Sorry, but it's true. Um, and that's partly because definitions of parts of speech are language-specific, involve morphological inflections on the words, kinds of syntactic constructions they occur in. Um, and in the typological literature, you see claims like, uh, this is a very popular claim, that this language has no adjectives. Um, and what they really mean is, this language doesn't take property concepts and predicate them with the same strategies you find in European languages. In particular, having a copula and not reflecting the property concept. So, when they say you read something like this statement, um, it's basically due based on European part of speech strategies. So, I mean, there are people that even say that this language has no noun verb distinction. And again, what they mean is that object concepts are predicated without a copula, but with inflection, unlike Russian. 
Um, so the solution to this problem, how do you get around this, these definitions that are dependent on language-specific strategies, is something I argued, as I said, all the way back. This is from my dissertation in this book, uh, and then in the other book, Radical Construction Grammar. Is that parts of speech represent a combination of semantic content, things like object concept, property concept, action concept, and information packaging, which are concepts like predication, reference, and modification. So this table is something I introduced in, again, way back in my 91 book. Um, so you have here, these are the semantic classes or information content. And then these are predication. I mentioned that a few times, modification, which is the main topic of the talk today in reference. And um, what we think of as your prototypical noun is, basic, is basically the upper left cell prototypical adjective is a modify a property concept used for modification, the middle cell, and then the uh, prototypical verb is an action that's predicated. So the prototypes are all on this diagonal. Um, but the fundamental fact about human language is, to put it broadly, is you can take semantic content and package it in pretty much any way you want. And I'll give you a few, couple slides here to show you that before I move on to the main topic of the talk. Uh, and that is, you can, refer to, you can refer to properties, you can refer to actions with complements or nominalizations. You can use an object concept as a modifier, so a possessive construction. You can use uh, action concepts as modifiers with relative clauses or participles. And as I said before, you can predicate object concepts and property concepts. And in English, you require a copula for that, um, but not for action concepts. So there's a way to do package information any way you want, but then there are specialized constructions in many, but not all, languages for uh, unexpected packaging of content. And the main point that I'm going to make in the next couple of slides, and it's basically the theme around the book that I'm writing right now, which is on for the, our advanced syntax class, where I, I show them all the gory details. And it's called the Morphosyntax, the Constructions of the World's Languages. It's a survey of all these uh, grammatical functions and the major strategies they've used that have been discussed in the typological literature. So this book is organized around that. and the main argument of the book is that it's not just parts of speech, but it's every kind of packaging. Every kind of concept is packaged in different ways. And it basically, you see this because you have this, it's where the most difficult problems are in defining these categories. And this is why. Um, so that's what I just said. Um, so for predicate argument structure, in English, grammar, or, or we, well, in dependency-based approaches, we distinguish subjects, objects, and oblique phrases. Uh, UD does that. It also has indirect objects. But I'll leave that aside for now. And then we have semantic roles like agent, theme, recipient. And basically, again, any of these semantic roles can be expressed as a subject in English. And this is our normal way. Uh, basically, the, this diagonal is the, the default or prototypical way. But you can use a passive voice and make the theme or the recipient the subject. Um, anything can be put as an oblique, passive voice here. Um, here we just have in English this alternation between the, and the double object construction. Uh, sorry, not the double object, but the alternation between present bill with and present the watch to. Uh, and then this is the alternative. Essentially, you can switch around what the direct object is as well. Now, in English, there's no obvious way to make the agent into the direct object. It's a fundamental asymmetry in English grammar. But there are some language families in the world. Algonquian is a Native American family. Austronesian are the languages found in the Oceania, and the Philippines, and so on, where essentially, I mean, people, again, it's a challenge to describe it from a theoretical point of view. But if you take this perspective, separating semantic content, semantic roles from grammatical relations, information packaging, then you can 
see that these languages actually have constructions where the agent looks like a direct object. And, and you shouldn't be surprised. It's also true in complex sentences. So people struggle, again, to define the difference between coordination and subordination. There are a number of linguists, um, Anna Vyazbitska and Leonard Talmy, who argued that there is a kind of conceptual difference in conceptualization. This is what I'm calling a difference in information packaging. But the clearest evidence that shows you that you need to distinguish the two is that you can take all these different semantic relations between events, so temporal relations, anterior, posterior overlap, cause, purpose, apprehensible, apprehensional. And in English, at least, you can express all of them using a subordinate clause with a subordinate conjunction, before, after, while, because, or by coordination, often and, but sometimes or, and the list goes on. Uh, less commonly discussed uh, semantic relations, circumstantials, negative circumstantials, additive, substitutive, subtractive, conditional. And you'll see that there's lots of different adverbial subordinate clauses, but then there are also ways to express it with coordination constructions, sometimes with but. Um, so if you have and, or, and but as your coordinating conjunctions, you can pretty much ex use them to express any of the semantic relations that are expressed with adverbial subordinating conjunctions that usually um, distinguish all the different semantic types. Uh, and lastly, this is actually where this whole approach is more widely accepted, um, where they have the topic comment type constructions, what they call a thetic or all new construction, uh, which is expressed slightly differently in English, but also with some prosodic differences expressed by these capitalized phrases. Uh, and then the identificational or focus constructions. It's the Mac that's my supreme is on the table, not the kitchen. And other languages have more specialized constructions, not just prosodic differences to express these. Um, so this all has to do with the information status. Uh, so if you read the linguistics literature about information structure, this is the kind they've looked at. But I think it's only one of at least the, the four types I've illustrated here. And once again, you have the same basic uh, semantic content, but it's packaged in different ways. So that's all to hopefully uh, give you a, a reason to believe that we want to distinguish between semantic content and information packaging. And some of the problematic cases, both in the analysis of a, a single language, like in the English grammar tradition, and cross-linguistic analysis, where there's all this variation, can be better explained by uh, referring to the fact that there are these different ways to package information. And languages sometimes develop specialized constructions to do that, and sometimes don't. Um, so what does this mean for UD? Well, the nice thing about this, and this is, as a linguist, this is a uh, general linguist, this is my feeling why UD has the potential for success, if you want to put it that way, which is that these information packaging functions are much more iso isomorphic to syntactic structures than either semantic classes or participant roles. I mean, anybody who's done annotation knows that it's a tough problem to annotate the semantics. But the information packaging is pretty close to the syntax. They're also less variable across languages. They're more universal than lexical semantics, or at least more obviously universal. I put this hedge in because, in fact, there, lexical semantics hasn't been very well explored from a cross-linguistic perspective. And my guess is there will be universals there if we can actually collect the data before it's too late, before we've lost all these endangered small languages that tell us what the patterns are. So in a sense, information packaging is really the function of these so-called structural properties of syntax. So in other words, there is a universal basis in terms of function, information packaging. And that's why I think UD will be successful, or, as, or is as successful as it has been, because it is capturing something that is common across languages. Now, there's a little hitch, which I'll need to bring in now before I go on to the specifics. Um, as I said, the main reason you want to separate semantic content and information packaging 
is that semantic content can be packaged in any way. So for example, an event like Sam resigned can function as an argument. I regret that Sam resigned. But then the argument, the event, which is functioning as an argument, has its own argument, namely Sam. He's the one who resigned. Objects can function as modifiers. This we'll need to refer to. And they can have their own modifiers. Events can function as modifiers, relative clauses. And then they have their own arguments again. So you get that's recursion, of course. Um, so you need to capture that. Um, so this is how we deal with it. Again, this is that same diagram I showed you for parts of speech. And color doesn't come out too well, but these, these cells are yellow. The yellow cells are the cases where you have the unexpected combination here. Objects functioning as modifiers. Actions, which have their own arguments, functioning as actions function as arguments, actions function as modifiers. And uh, all these terms here are basically the names of universal dependency, well, universal dependencies, UD dependencies. Some of them uh, we've lumped together for teaching purposes, so we don't distinguish these two. We don't distinguish different kinds of modifiers. This is what this, this, is what this talk is going to be about, mainly. Uh, we don't distinguish different complements. But basically, we acknowledge that there's something special about the constructions here. Uh, and so does UD. And the way it's acknowledged is by distinguish the, distinguishing the dependencies. So again, I'm in agreement with UD about how to handle that problem. So this is the scheme that we use. Um, I can toggle back and forth between this. This is the UD version 2 scheme. You'll see it's the UD version 2 scheme has dependencies for capturing relations between complex sentences within complex predicates. I won't talk about that much today. Well, not at all. Different kinds of arguments, including complements. Different kinds of modifiers, including relative clauses, noun modifiers, and apposition. And basically, the main difference between UD and the scheme that we use for teaching is, as you'll see, it's simpler. It has that we use, the scene we have is simpler. We use a smaller number of dependencies. In particular, we just have mod. We have n mod and, and adjectival clauses separately, but we have one modifier um, dependency. And that's what we're going to focus on today, because uh, as you see, UD has three different kinds. And that's what I'll be talking about mainly. OK, so these general principles, including two others that I didn't mention, they're mainly ways in which typology can help UD by coming up with some general principles about cross-linguistic variation, how to analyze it, that can be used to sort of come up with the best inventory of UD dependencies, the 40-odd dependencies that you find when you go to the UD website. As I said, there are some differences between what UD does and what I would do. Um, and I will be talking about that a little bit. But in some sense, as I realized looking at the UD work, is that actually isn't the hardest part. We can all ask somebody who's working on a tree bank of, well, Czech or Spanish or Hindi, Japanese, to use the UD dependencies, you know, that list of 40 odd dependencies, to describe the grammatical constructions of their languages, the individual sentences in their corpus. But how do we know that they're using them in the way, the same way that the Japanese linguist is using them in the same way as the Hindi linguist, as the Czech linguist, as the English linguist? Um, there needs to be consistency on how these are applied to the different languages. And I've talked to the, the leaders of the UD project, so I know that this is an issue. And I'm not surprised because, of course, we have the same issue in looking at it in the teaching perspective. So, this is where the guidelines come in. And this is where it's not just that you have to come up with what you think is the best list of dependencies to use across languages, the 40 odd dependencies. You have to come up with pretty uh, way, guidelines for consistent application of those dependencies to the much greater diversity of language constructions that you find across the world's languages. And especially if you're looking at lots of languages low resource, high diversity languages uh, like we have to in teaching. Um, so what's the best way to do it? That's what that purple sentence or purple phrase in the middle bullet point is about, is 
you have to find are there cross-linguistic universals that constrain which strategies you use and which constructions. It won't be perfect. There will always be exceptions, remember. But if you find the right useful universals, they will show the cleanest way to make the cuts, those you know, ultimately arbitrary divisions, and say, OK, if you got a construction and your language is like this, you call it this. And if you have one that's like that, you call it something different. So you want to find it in the case that minimizes the number of languages, which will always be greater than 0, the number of languages that, um, where even your guidelines don't work very well. I mean, there will always be such languages. But if it's only a handful out of the hundreds or thousands of languages in the world, then you know, from a practical point of view, you've done a good job. So I had this bullet point when I gave an earlier version of this talk at the UD workshop. It's a good news, bad news talk. Um, but sadly, today's focus is mostly on the notion of bad news. Bad news in the sense of facts about the lingu languages of the world that would actually suggest changing the UD uh, dependencies, in particular these modifier dependencies, and also the multi-word expressions. We'll also be talking about those. So I'll give you one example of good news where the the typo typological universals cut things the same way that UD does, and then we'll talk about the problems with excuse me the problems with modification constructions. Okay, just to give you a little good news. So um, UD and in my teaching, we distinguish core roles, subject, direct object, indirect object from oblique roles. Um, this is actually controversial among typologists. Uh, to make a long story short, my feeling is there is a way to define subject cross-linguistically. It's just not the way that most typologists complain about when they criticize. So how do you do it in practice? Now remember, we can't rely on these semantic participant roles, agent, patient, instrument, because we ju I just showed you with that table that they can have any grammatical role. So how do we do it? And there are all these constructions that mess up the semantic syntactic roles. Um, well, first I should say there is a functional, the information packaging criterion behind subject, object, and oblique is roughly salience or topicality of the argument. There are text studies that show that the argument, the reference that's expressed as a subject is the most topical in that section of discourse whether it's an agent or a patient, and that's reflected by uh, a voice difference like passive. But what I want to do is actually look at the strategies that we use to encode arguments. So the first one is case marking, case inflections, or add positions. I'm sorry I don't have examples of these. I did throw in some more examples of modification strategies this morning, but I didn't do this. Uh, indexation is agreement, so agreement of the verb with the subject. Many languages, the verb also agrees with the object uh, and word order. Now, there are categories of case mark, uh, ca lots of different categories of case marking. So all these terms like nominative and accusative, and in some languages, ergative and absolutive, uh, other kinds of categories that vary a lot. Also, there are languages where there's mismatches between um, the case, what the case marking suggests and what the agreement pattern suggests. So we're going to kind of avoid that. Um, it, it exists. Uh, we have to recognize it, but it's not that common. So how safe is it to rely on these strategies to distinguish, in particular, core versus oblique? Subject versus object is harder, and I won't talk about it. Well, it turns out there's two general universals about case marking and agreement, or indexation, that essentially say we can do it in principle at least. If the case marking is zero, so in a language like English, there's no prepositions in front of subject or object, if the case marking is zero, then the argument is overwhelmingly likely to be core. If it's an oblique phrase, it's, not, it's very rare to get zero coding. If the predicate indexes the argument, agrees with the argument, then the argument is overwhelmingly likely to be core. So as I said, languages agree with subjects, sometimes with objects, but they don't agree with obliques, mostly. So these two things mean 
there's actually a pretty sharp distinction in many languages between core and oblique phrases. The core phrases will have zero case marking, and the verb may agree with it. The oblique phrases will almost always have overt case marking, and the verbs will never agree with them. So that's good. Um, so as it says here, if you can assume that argument phrase has zero coded case marking and or the verb agrees with it, it's core, and you don't have to worry about semantic roles. That works most of the time. It is a one-way implication. It's not a biconditional relation. So you have languages, you know, like Czech, you've got case marking for core arguments, nominative, accusative, um, and Czech indexes the subject but not the object. So the object's not indexed and yet it's a core argument. So it's not going to work in every case, but basically by you can kind of extrapolate from the, lang the many languages of the world where it works and try to make it, it and then try to make the assessment for a language like Czech, for example. So it's not perfect. I mean, it doesn't give you, the typology very rarely gives you biconditional universals, if and only if. But one-way universals will definitely tell you where you should draw the line, and then you can work on developing guidelines for a language, a more problematic language like Czech, uh, that will deal with the cases that don't quite fit the, the universals. OK, now for modifiers. Um, I talked very a little bit about this when I gave an earlier version of the talk. Uh, of course, Jan and Dan heard that version, so they've heard pretty much everything you've just heard. And they asked me to write, talk about something different. I mentioned I was working on a textbook for the more advanced class where I go into all the gory details about the language variation. Um, and at the time, I had not written a chapter on uh, modification constructions. And I already knew that they were problematic. They haven't been as well explored as predicate argument relations. That's they're the best explored in typological research, just like everywhere else. Um, so I had to read a lot of the linguistics or the typological literature on modification constructions. I mean, I knew a little bit about what was going on, but I needed to explore it in more detail. I've done that now, so now I have a few more things to say about that modification constructions and multi-word expressions and what consequences they would have both for our teaching syntax and for UD. So the first thing is that modifiers of nouns are semantically extremely varied. That's the thing about that makes it complicated. So you have articles that express the category of a semantic category or pragmatic category of definiteness. Demonstratives express deixis. Uh, cardinal numerals express cardinality. Quantifiers are quantification. Category that I and a research assistant of mine called set member. These are words that pick out a member of an ordered set. So ordinal numerals like first, second, third work that way but also words like another, next, and last help pick out members of an ordered set. Property concepts, which we usually think of as adjectives. Actions, so relative clauses. Possession, which are these noun modifier types, called genitives, possession, other relations between two entities that are expressed, where one is a modifier. So they're semantically extremely varied. Now. UD, you saw there, I think there was nine different semantic types. UD has five different uh, semantic, uh, mostly semantically defined uh, dependencies. So they have debt determiner for definiteness and deixis, num mod for cardinality, so just for numeral modifiers, a mod like adjective modifier for properties, but a mod is also used for quantifiers and these set member expressions. N mod is used for possession and other entity entity relations, like, you know, the, the book on the table, where on the table is modifying book. Uh, ACL is used for actions and relative clauses. Um, so it distinguishes five, but it doesn't distinguish all nine, and I'm sure they didn't want to because that would proliferate the number of dependencies that people would have to use for annotation. Now, the other problem is, however many semantic types there are, there's also a lot of different constructions that are used. There's strategies used to just for modification. So first is uh, 
the traditional kind of gender number agreement. I have another slide with examples of all these because uh, not all of these are obvious or you know, known or common in European languages. Uh, indexing, agreeing. Here it's the head noun agrees in person of a, with a possessor. I'll show you examples. Classifiers, numeral classifiers, and other kinds of classifiers that are found in East Asian languages. So including big high resource languages like Chinese and Japanese, as well as Thai and Korean. Case marking, so genitives. These are just the historical sources of these. And more grammaticalized category. These are categories of uh, invariant particles that are used to link words, um, which historically come from case marking or classifiers or gender number agreement, but uh, you can't tell that now. OK, so here's a slide showing you some examples. Uh, I also forgot, there's the other strategy is nothing at all. You just juxtapose the two words. And so this is a possessive that just means Akande's cap. Case marking, so John's book with a genitive case suffix in Russian. Uh, Non-person gender number agreement in Spanish. Um, old books, so it's masculine plural suffix on old. Agreeing with a masculine plural form of books. Uh, the linker. This is the more grammaticalized form. You find it in Farsi and Persian. It just simply means Hassan's book, but it's just a single invariant form that links the two. And in English, Hassan's book, that apostrophe S, is basically a linker. Uh, historically, it comes from the genitive, the Germanic genitive. Sometimes you get a special form. So in this Syrian Arabic, that's uh, that fellow's story. So the word, the word for story here is in a special form that you wouldn't get um, when it's not modified by the possessive. And then you have the orphan's prize, so it's literally its or his prize, the orphan. Um, so you have a third singular on the head noun prize agreeing with orphan. Uh, and then with classifier, we have uh, Cantonese is a variety of Chinese. So you have one, and then you have a word which is sometimes translated long object for a crossbow. So there's a huge variety of strategies and a huge variety of semantic types. And if the world were wonderful, this, the strategies would be restricted to certain semantic types, and we can make nice divisions between the modifiers. Unfortunately, the world or it's, is not so neat. So as I said, there's no universals about modifier strategies that more or less neatly divide modifier types. There's one qualification. Um, so here, you're going to see some animations. The agreement, um, there's classifiers, and then these linkers. I'll explain to you why I've put these things on the screen in this way in a, a few slides. But we'll start, agreement kind of starts from some kind of dyxis definiteness, and then it can spread to all these other things. It can even spread to possession. I got it like a, this is the, you know, the agreeing parts, uh, the agreeing uh, proper names. Um, for classifiers, they can start with numerals, but then they get used for demonstratives, and then they get used for property modifiers, and then they get used for everything else. There are a special category of possessive classifiers found in some languages, but as far as I know, they don't seem to spread to other kinds of modifiers. Linkers start as some kind of relative clause marker or subordinator, but then they get spread to property concepts, which are often expressed in the set using the same strategies as uh, relative clauses or action modifiers. And then they'll spread to numerals, even to possession. That's that Farsi linker I showed you before. So you can see it's a mess. These lines, the different colored arrows go everywhere. Oh, yeah, and then you can get possessive mo uh, linkers to be used for property modification. We're actually going to see a couple examples of this at the very end of the talk. Um, oh, I didn't, should have suppressed these slides. Sorry about that. We'll get to see this uh, fireworks again, and then we'll get to the linkers. Then we'll go back to why I have these things laid out the way they are once we get all those linkers in. So, for this reason, um, in my teaching, I just have a single dependency modifier because 
I couldn't, there's no way you can divide these strategies up. Now, my original motivation when I was teaching the class was to avoid making the syntactic annotation too dependent on the semantics, these nine different categories of modifiers. Um, but then later, when, as I said, I worked on this modification chapter for my book, the more advanced textbook, the sort of anything goes, any strategy is used, supports this. Uh, it is, from a practical point of view, if you were trying to write guidelines to tell people what to do to distinguish different kinds of modifiers, you'd almost always have to fall back on the semantics. And that generally in UD is something that is a principle that they try to avoid. And I support that attempt to avoid that. Um, now, you'll notice that we did retain nmod and ACL. So noun modifiers and relative clauses or adjectival clauses. Now, it does cause problems. Actually, this is the problem I'm going to address, so I'll skip that bullet point. I should have changed that. But it's a problem we can live with, and I will show you a solution to that problem. Um, because the reason we separated this out is the reason I explained earlier in the talk. Uh, noun phrases have modifiers like other noun phrases, and relative clauses have arguments like other clauses. So we want to make sure we can't, you know, that not every modifier ends up having a possible modifier dependent and argument dependent that where you restrict them just to noun modifiers and relative clauses. Um, but there's actually another reason for this. So a statistical analysis called multidimensional scaling, which um, you can use, you can input uh, data, you know, noisy data, and it will try to find similarity relations among modifier types in this case and re represent these similarity relations in a Euclidean space. Um, that's that layout that I showed you. I didn't have locative modifiers in there, or set member and quantifier. It made it a little simpler, but that's where that layout came from. This is the output of the multidimensional scaling program. It's unpublished data I've never gotten around to publishing. So ACL and EDMOD, you see, are separated out. Over here, there's some overlap with locative. I won't go into that. But they're pretty separate from each other, apart from this. Uh, and they're also separate from the others, which are, as you can see, spatially to the right with a gap. So you just call the rest mod. That was a decision that we made that I talked about. Um, from a UD perspective, if you put in the UD modifiers, uh, then it looks a lot messier, and these uh, and then that, and that you're dividing things that are close to each other, um, and so it's harder to support that kind of distinction, except in semantic terms. Instead, if I back up to the other one, you know, those seem to cluster together. So that's the reason I would give for that. But now there's another problem. I said, modification poses a lot of problems. Multi-word expressions. So people who work in computational linguistics have been dealing with multi-word expressions for a long time. Um, there's a, a paper that seems to be widely cited. I say seems because I don't work in, mainly in computational linguistics, but certainly people I know cited a paper from 2002 who uh, Sagadel had divided up three types. So Sagadel had a type called fixed multi-word expressions. These are frozen strings that are uninflectable often borrowing, so in English something like ménage à trois, which comes from French, and even though the French phrase can be analyzed and English speakers don't understand the analysis or rendezvous. Um, so UD, UD which uh, substantially revised their uh, annotation of multi-word expressions in version two, used fix to essentially restrict it to just the fixed type from the Sagadel paper. It's a paper I like a lot, too, so I, I, I like this. UD then has two uh, flat and compound two dependencies. These are Sagadel's semi-fixed multi-word expressions, which are broadly frozen but inflectable. Uh, UD flat is exocentric, compound is endocentric. So the kind of thing we're thinking of are you know noun, noun, compounds, like noun, noun, compound which can be inflected. You can say noun, noun, compounds, plural. Um, so they're frozen in form. That it's a particular connotation that has a particular idiosyncratic meaning. 
but you can inflect it for singular and plural, for example. And that one, of course, would be compound in that sense, endocentric, it has a head. Now, personally, um, I think trying to distinguish exocentric and endocentric could be a bit problematic for an annotator. Uh, we don't do it in our, in this, our teaching of syntax. Um, but uh, I didn't think it was that big an issue. Um, the term compound in UD also includes uh, serial verb constructions. The thing is, those are not really semi-fixed multi-word expression in Sagadell's sense, but this has to do with complex predicates, and that's a category I haven't talked about. It's something which I've talked to the, you know, the people in the UD team that they were aware that the UD needs to work on uh, the analysis of uh, the dependencies for complex predicates, and I won't talk about that here. And there's, that would be a whole other talk if we did. What I really want to focus on are the noun, noun, compound type because those are modifiers. So here's the problem. So you remember I said there were all these different strategies for expressing modifiers. And when it came to standard semantic types of modifiers, you know, dictic, definiteness, property concepts, quantifiers, numerals, and so on, we saw that the strategies were like all over the place. Well, I hate to tell you this, but when it comes to things that we would all agree are multi-word expressions, you get the same range of strategies. And they're pretty much laid out the same way as I had on that previous table. So compound, I had juxtaposition there. They can be phonologically unified. But you see, this is what we normally think of as a compound, just two nouns juxtaposed, maybe um, combined into a single phonological word. But in French, you got, this is, these are all for railroad or, uh, you know, road of iron, so we have the case marker, the preposition. You can get uh, in derivation and then use the kind of gender number uh, agreement, so Zhelyaznaya Daroga for uh, in Russian, feminine singular because Daroga is feminine singular. A linker, an invariant form in Malagash. Special form, that, remember I mentioned that construct form in Syrian Arabic, we had a special form. Well, here's a special form from modern Hebrew, also with that T, with a construct form for the railroad. Uh, and then personal indexation, where the head noun agrees with the modifying noun, third person singular. So it's like, oh no. And this is a work of a, actually a guy who's a PhD student up in uh, Oslo, I think. He's a couple papers, he's going to do his research, I guess, in this area. I've yet to talk to him. He came up with this name, which is useful. Um, you want to distinguish between strategies, uh, like these multi-word expressions and these all these strategies, and the function they're expressing, the function they're performing. So they're all what he calls binomial naming constructions. So what that means is all these different kinds of strategies are used to take two object concept words in combination to name a single concept, railroad. So, we're in trouble here. Um, so just like with the different semantic modifier types, we cannot use the strategies as guidelines to distinguish modifiers proper from these binomial naming constructions across languages. Um, but if, like the UD people, I too would like to distinguish these, so how do we do it? I mean, there is a way. It's a completely different approach. It's actually more pragmatically based um, a lot of this is based on recent papers, last 10 or 15 years, by Maria Kopchevskaya Tom at Stockholm, a typologist. Um, but it goes back to a distinction made by a, in a paper by Paul Kay and Carl Zimmer from the 1970s, um, and may go further back than that. And they distinguish them in terms of anchoring versus non-anchoring or typifying. So they say that there is a basis for distinguishing possessive modifiers, regular modifier constructions, from things that we would call compounds, you know, more idiosyncratic, more tightly, semantically idiosyncratic, more tightly bound. Um, so the anchoring modifiers, these are the possessive types. Um, like the professors of the university, John's parakeet, that girl's book, these phrases 
serve as reference points to identify the referent of the head noun, you know, which professors, which parakeet, which book. We know the specific reference, these are all specific or definite reference, and those reference pin down the, the uh, how, how to identify this reference. So we have a lot, lots of parakeets in the world, but if it's John's, then we can pick out the right parakeet that, that we want to identify, likewise with the book. These typifying modifiers are non-referential, and all they do is they refer to a subclass of a broader class they do not in themselves identify the specific referent of the head noun. So when we talk about university professors, people like me or Jan, Eva, you know, we're talking about a category of people. So that's the single concept that's a binomial naming construction. You can do that in other ways. So there's a bird that in English is called the Townsend's Warbler. You'll notice it has the apostrophe S, the linker. Um, but that refers to a a species of bird, a species of warbler. Yeah, it looks like a possessive construction, but it's not being used like John's parakeet, which refers to a particular bird by referring to a particular individual. This is a general name that has some historical origin with somebody named Townsend, but it's just a species of bird. And likewise, women's magazine refers to a particular category of magazines. It's not you know, some woman's magazine. And the reason you can tell that is that these typifying object modifiers are all non-referential. So as Kay and Zimmer back in the 70s and other number of linguists since then have argued, the way to distinguish compounds in the function sense and binomial naming constructions from modifiers is whether that the non-head word is a specific or definite noun phrase, like on the left, or whether it's a generic, non-specific phrase, like the ones on the right. So we are going to something which is basically a semantic or at least pragmatic criterion, but this can consistently distinguish these across languages. So I think this is a case where, you know, I think we're all in agreement that we want to distinguish between so-called true modifiers and these compound expressions. But the way to do it is not through strategies, but through this kind of function, this pragmatic distinction, which you can teach people, students or annotators, to identify. It's, it's not impossible. We do it. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the fun doesn't end there. Um, because you yeah, have a similar problem arises with numeral classifiers and numerals in general. Um, and there was some discussion, which I participated in, on the Universal Dependencies GitHub site, uh, one of the issues there. Um, but at the time, I hadn't, I hadn't done this chapter, so I didn't know all of the details, and particularly this anchoring, non-anchoring, or typifying contrast. But then I extended it to the issue of numeral classifiers. So I had this example before up on the screen. Uh, many languages, including Chinese, Cantonese, you have a classifier that's used for, you know, what we think of as run-of-the-mill individuated entities. You know, things that occur as distinct units of the same type. And anytime you use a numeral with them, and in many languages, demonstratives and other modifiers, you have to have a word which picks out some property of this object, like being long. And in the linguistics literature on classifiers, they call these sortal classifiers. They have natural units of count nouns, and they define a sort in some sense. The semantics gets complicated, but that's not for our concern. The problem is that they also use the, the same construction to describe what the typological literature calls menstrual classifiers. And these are used to individuate and count any other unit than the, so to speak, the natural unit of count nouns. So, Here's a measure. I think this is some kind of food stuff. It's a measure it's used in, in, Thai, in well, it's Cantonese, used in Hong Kong. Uh, some kind of container, it's like two bowls of rice. Some kind of group, so a group of students. Um, a piece of something, so rain is not countable. A lot of these nouns are not countable, so a few drops of rain. And also species, this kind of flower, 
people have different subclassifications of menstrual classifiers. I'm just using some of the common ones they have. Um, but there are a number of important differences here. Oops, no. Sortal classifiers, the, the, the true numeral classifiers, like the long object crossbow, they may be optional. You won't need the classifier. Uh, classifiers in many languages are restricted to lower numerals, or they're not found with base, numeral bases like 10, 20, 30, 100. Uh, and then, of course, they don't have equivalents in other languages. You know, English and Czech don't really have anything like sort of classifiers, and hardly anything like that. Menstrual classifiers, on the other hand, are always obligatory. They have to be, because that's how you know what sort of unit. These are words that don't have a natural unit, or you're not referring to the natural unit, like a group of students instead of one student. So they're all some kind of unnatural unit. And of course, they have equivalents in other languages. I mean, pretty much any language, you want to be able to be able to measure and count some kind of unnatural units. Again, as I said, languages are all purpose communication systems. So they aren't the same. And this is part of the issue that came up in that discussion in the UD website is the Chinese linguists, you know, from the Chinese project were discussing this and saying, well, I mean, there were a lot of other functions they were talking about too, which I said were different functions. Most people agreed, but these menstrual classifiers get lumped in with the sortal classifiers and they really need to be distinguished. Um, and these are some crucial properties. Now, as I said, other languages have menstrual constructions. They just don't look like the classifier construction that you find in Chinese and other East Asian languages. Um, they have this construction that are called pseudo-partitives, not a great name. They're a kind of menstrual construction, though. And you'll see you've got, it's called a pseudo-partitive because you have of there, a cup of coffee. But they're not anchoring constructions. So this is an anchoring construction. You say a cup of the Ethiopian coffee. You got, say, some particular kinds of coffee on the table, and you want a cup of this kind of coffee. That's referring to a specific cup, you know, a specific volume of uh, coffee that you're interested in. Whereas a cup of coffee is just saying there's some coffee here, and we're measuring it out. Now here's the tricky part. The pseudo partitives have kind of flipped their head compared to the anchoring counterpart. Everyone would agree that in a cup of the Ethiopian coffee, a cup is the head, and of the Ethiopian coffee, this anchoring modifier is the modifier. Um, and that's what the syntax kind of suggests, or the, the grammar, the of here. Um, so we'd all agree with that. A cup of coffee, though, doesn't work the same way. You can say, I drank a cup of coffee. You can't say, I broke a cup of coffee. If you want to say something like that, you have to say, I broke a coffee cup, which, of course, is this other kind of compound construction in English. So here's a proposal to analyze these menstrual constructions, which I'm sure will annoy everybody, but it works. So please hear me out. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about for concluding. So menstrual constructions should be analyzed as modifiers. So that was the point of the, I broke a cup of coffee. That, that, that's bad, but I drank a cup of coffee. Is that coffee is the object of drink, and that's what you'd expect, because it's a liquid, a potable liquid. Um, so menstrual constructions should be analyzed as modifiers specifically menstrual noun modifiers in both Cantonese and English. So in Cantonese, as I said, this is the part that's going to annoy everyone. So here you go. It means we're going to analyze sortal modifiers in the usual way. This is the head noun. It's one. The numeral is modifying this. So this is the content word to content word principle, because every language is going to have a numeral, but only a few languages have these sortal classifiers. So that'll be a dependent as a classifier for one crossbow. But two bowls of rice, which kind of looks the same in Cantonese, uh, 
bowl is going to be modifying rice, like, like a quantifier, basically. And we're going to see quantifiers work. We're going to have to do the same thing with quantifiers. And then two is modifying bowls of rice. Well, you can do it this way. I don't know why I did it this way instead of that way. But um, well, well let's, we can talk about that later. The main point is that the rice is the head. And it's um, and then in English, so with two cups of the Ethiopian coffee, it's going to be the usual. Here's cup. It's the two's modifying cup. Ethiopian coffee is the noun modifier, typical possessive modifier of cup. But two cups of coffee, cup is modifying noun modifier, just like I did with Cantonese. Use two is modifying cup. And then this of has basically been syntactically reanalyzed as a linker. It's no longer representing a dependency relation, a dependent, coffee is a dependent of cup. It is now just a construction for menstrual classification as a linker. Now, as I said, this is going to annoy everybody. Um, but there are some reasons to do it this way. And then I'm going to show you some crazier language stuff that's going to make it um, hopefully more plausible. So if you do it this way, the content words are analyzed the same way between the two languages. The noun, uh, the menstrual construction, word is dependent on the noun, and the numeral is dependent on the menstrual word. So that's the same from both Cantonese and English for the menstrual constructions. And recall that menstrual classifiers are not the same as sortal classifiers in their syntax even. Um, they're, not, they're obligatory, sortal ones are not. And then pseudopartitives differ in their headedness properties from true partitives. So I think there are good reasons to analyze them differently, and then this is the kind of analysis that the principles of the content word to content word principle would, would uh, essentially suggest. Now it gets a little more complicated because numerals and quantifiers also have an anchored and non-anchored type and with a flipped head. So people would generally, people, everybody would analyze five men as men is the head and five is the modifier some friends. Five of the men, normally five would be as the head, of the men would be a noun modifier, same with some of my friends. And here's the kicker. The anchored construction, just like with a pseudopartitive, the anchored construction has been extended to the non-anchored meaning. So check for nominative accusative. Russian, it's more widespread, and it's only for the you get the genitive plural on five men. So you get a genitive, even though standard analysis is men is the head and five is the modifier. I mean, I don't know how do you how you analyze this and check. Well, you can tell me in two minutes when I'm done with the talk. Well, it gets worse than than what you see, but it's true that. It, in many languages, quantifiers and numerals, even in the non-anchored construction, where we would all want to analyze the noun as the head and the quantifier and numeral as the modifier. In a lot of languages, the noun is in a genitive or partitive case. And so the Czech example is actually not that unusual. Or the English partit pseudo-partitive, a cup of coffee, typologically. Actually, Kopczewska Tom says that's pretty rare outside of Europe, the pseudo-partitive with the of. You get more of a simple juxtaposition like you get in Cantonese and uh, other languages with classifiers. So here's that African language, Akose, which I mentioned earlier. So you'll notice, so what they do, they have a very complicated construction. So the walls of the house, it's a language that has noun classes. Um, this is a linker called an associative marker in Bantu, or in, you know, Bantu linguistics. And it agrees with the head noun. So the walls, class, walls is class eight, so the social market is class A. This is the genitive dependent, the walls of the house. Fine, had, noun modifier. A good shirt. So one way to say this in this language is shirt of goodness, literally. So that's what you'd expect. This is the dependent. It's a property concept. Shirt's the head. 
unfortunately, the grammar didn't gloss which class this is, but it agrees in class with shirt. OK, that's fine. This is the modifier. That's the modifier, same construction. Uh, however, the non-anchored construction, the non-anchored, the function, the mensural construction look, uses a, uh, the same strategy as the anchored construction. So you have a bottle of water. So again, associated marker agrees with bottle, and you've got water, different class, doesn't agree with that. But semantically, or conceptually, whatever, you know, if you believe the analysis I gave of the pseudo partitive, you would also say the water should be the head and the bottle is the modifier. And here's some evidence to suggest that maybe this is the right thing to do. For some modifiers, some property concepts, they do it this way, just like the anchor construction. But down here, there are other modifiers in the same language. So the way you say raw meat, which refers to meat, is literally rawness of meat. The classifier agrees with rawness, and then meat is different. So actually, as the color coding indicates, I would analyze these just like the others. This is the head. That's the modifier. Same here. And then here, it's the other way around. With a, it's a menstrual construction, so the measure is the modifier, and the object concept is the head. And that's even true here, where this is a property concept. And it translates as raw meat, where undoubtedly this is the head. So those are all uh, looking at some examples from other languages, including as exotic languages, Czech, that this rather uh, unattractive looking solution is probably, the, I still I think, is probably the, the best solution from a cross linguistic perspective. Even You just have to recognize that there is a sin. There are changes that happen when a construction gets, a strategy gets extended to another construction whose function you know, flips what the head is. Oh, I have run much longer than I expected. I am sorry. Um, here are the conclusions. Uh, that there are these typological universals that can correlate morphosyntactic strategies with information packaging lead to useful annotation guidelines. I should have added or changed that last bullet point to say that the kind of examples I focused on this afternoon really show you that the strategies so don't always help you, but there are other ways to come up with reliable guidelines that you can apply across languages no matter what their you know, strategies they employ for these constructions. So thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I went much longer than I expected. Yeah, thank you very much for your inform uh, for a very informative uh, talk, and I think that we uh, will have to have some time to think it over with the with the arguments. But still, we have some uh, time to ask questions. Uh, I would like to ask about the. Uh, about your last example, um, it, it seems to me that you uh, try uh, uh, the other way around. Uh, John Bybee and William Pagliuca uh, uh, yeah, tried to extract Pagliuca tried yeah. to extract uh, universal language concepts from. Uh, phenomena which are gram uh, grammaticalized, which are morphologically uh, <coughs> ex expressed in as many languages uh, as cross-lingually as possible. Uh, uh, based on, on your example here, it seems to me that you just approach it the other way around, that, that you impose some, uh, uh, th that you don't look for, it, for the grammaticalization, but, but uh, just approach it more psychologically. Is it right? Um, not quite. I mean, let's, let me see if I can get back all the way to the... Um, so this slide here, basically, or even this slide. So we ha I, I pointed out here the problem is that you've got these, all these things are used for these binomial naming constructions, 
I think everybody in, in you know in typology and you know, grammaticalization theory would agree that these constructions are more grammaticalized versions of your standard run-of-the-mill modification constructions. They've come to be used for in a semantically idiosyncratic way to refer to some single concept like railroad. So that's sort of the first step. I mean, the, the, my broad argument was um, if you look at these binomial naming constructions, then there's a lot of different strategies. Historically, they all come from regular modification constructions. Um, so then we have to use this anchoring versus non-anchoring distinction to distinguish them. And then the rest of this about the classifiers, this is to argue that that anchoring versus non-anchoring distinction also occurs in the const mensural constructions, numeral constructions, and quantifier constructions, where the effect of the grammaticalization process is to actually flip the head. So what used to be the head was in the non in the anchoring version was the measure term, the numeral, or the quantifier. But then when they become those constructions get extended to the non-anchoring function, then it's the noun, the, the, the object word, that is now the head. And the mensural, numeral, and quantifier is the modifier. And then I just threw out a bunch of examples showing that even if you tried to use the standard criteria for head modifier, it, it just gets you into trouble. And it gets you into bigger trouble when you get to languages like Czech and like Akose. Um, so I mean, you know, you could ask, is this really a grammaticalization process? Well, it depends on what you mean by grammaticalization. I mean, I think the universal pattern is that the strategies used for anchoring constructions, anchoring modifier constructions, get extended to the non-anchoring constructions. And in some cases, that means the head flips, and then the, it looks like there's a mismatch, so to speak, between the syntax and the semantics. But I think it's because of the nature of the non-anchoring constructions. And so we should be consistent in analyzing the non-anchoring constructions in a uniform way. Somehow it st still seems to me that, that you have to make the choice uh, based either on, I have seen this grammaticalized structurally marked in many languages, yeah. or uh, to me it's just uh, to me, it's perfectly semantically conceivable, but I can't find this structurally anchored in my own language. So should I, <laughs> should I take into account that other languages have it? Uh, and, and should I impose it on my language? Or should I do it the other way around? And then, then I think it's always a matter of arbitrary. Well, the thing is that sometimes you can find indirect evidence for that. Because basically, what the problem with the English pseudopartitives or the Cantonese menstrual classifiers is they look like something else. They look like the anchoring of constructions in English. They look like the sortal classifiers in Cantonese. So you have to look for more indirect evidence for why they shouldn't be analyzed the same way. So things like you can't say I broke a cup of coffee or that menstrual classifiers are obligatory and sortal ones are optional or sortal ones don't exist for higher numerals or bases. You know, various kinds of more, you know, more indirect or subtler evidence to suggest that actually they don't work the same way. So yes, they aren't really the same construction, which mo motivates analyzing them differently. Yes, but on the other hand, you uh, you would lump uh, lump all noun modifiers into just mod, and 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 drop uh, new mod and and n mod and and and, yes, and a mod. Now, you know, I mean, this is a legitimate question to ask. You know, and this is where the kind of like the practical question comes in. Um, I lump them all together because uh, it's not the, the strategies don't help you. So you could, I mean, the other sort of uh, abstractly or kind of legally consistent way to do it would be to differentiate them semantically. But then you may as well differentiate all nine types semantically. Well, practically, that's not a, a good solution. So from a practical point of view, the things that are you can most strongly differentiate are the relative clauses and the noun modifiers. So we do that in teaching. Uh, UD does that. I don't have any objections to that. I think it's more problematic with the others. Because I, I mean, to be honest, when I first encountered UD, I thought new mod was kind of used for quantification. Because you can see there's a whole family of mm -hmm. issues around menstrual, numeral, and quantifier mm -hmm. constructions. 
where they all behave in a similar but wacky way. So maybe you group it together. But NUMOD is actually narrowly just for numerals, not for quantifiers or mensural phrases. So I think that actually, you know, if I were doing UD and if I wanted to split the modifiers, I'd have determiners and then I'd have this sort of family of numeral quantifier menstruals and then I'd have property modifiers. But, um, you know, I think actually it's, because the semantics is almost self-evident from the meanings of the words, the content words, so why bother to distinguish them? And this is me take, taking a practical point of view. Why bother to distinguish them for a practical task like annotation, syntactic annotation, because it's in the semantics. Now I've had some discussions, so I think Chris Manning said to me that, you, you know, you want to have kind of multiple, you know, sort of partially redundant annotation. So yeah, the part of the speech will tell you that it's a quantifier or a demonstrative, mm -hmm. and the de but they, they want the dependencies also to do it. Whereas actually in my class, because I don't want students to make the same mistake twice and get counted down for twice for making just one mistake. I just tell them, you know, identify that these are all modifiers and then label the words as dictic or property concepts and numerals. But these are really practical questions. I mean, I kind of agree with you that, yeah, all, the, you know, all these different semantic categories should be distinguished and we should always think about, you know, how each of these different semantic types of modifiers is expressed in a language because it could vary. Um, but I say from a practical point of view of a first year undergraduate class or a UD, we'll want to probably make fewer distinctions. Thank you very much. My last is why would you drop n mod when it's <clears throat> well, oh, it's, why would I? Oh, I don't. I, I, uh, no, no. Well, uh, you, you just you, you merged it, uh, yeah. and and uh, when when a proposi prepositional group is hang uh, is hanging on on a noun, then it says something about the noun as well many times. It's it's. Uh, oh, you mean oh whether it's uh, well that like like, well, like yeah, a uh, city in the south, we, right. we would say it's just uh, the south is just a modifier, while. To me, it, it adds some information that, that it's either a location or, or, it's, or, or there's something about the noun that, well, that, that is yeah. property or, or, or event or something like that. I think there are the problems with the phrase the south because, you know, otherwise I think of it as an anchoring phrase. So if we're mm -hmm. talking contrasting mm -hmm. the city in the south from the city in the north, mm -hmm. then it would be anchoring. It's, you know, it helps you identify which city you're talking about. But if you're talking about the city of the south or cities of the south, where the South just refers generically to some kind of category, then it would be not anchoring. But it's hard for me to think about that. I mean, it shows you that anchoring versus non-anchoring isn't a perfect match with, def you know, grammatically definite or specific versus non-specific. But again, I feel like if you're trying to find the most, you know, the, the most reliable, never perfect, but the most reliable, most consistent cross-linguistic way to distinguish between so-called compounds or multi-word expressions and regular modifier constructions. And this anchoring versus non-anchoring is probably the best way to go. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, and I have a general question. Yeah. How do you deal with spoken data, or do you distinguish between spoken and written syntax, or do you use the same guidelines for both of them? Well, I would use the same guidelines for both of them because, you know, with the kind of languages that typologists use, most of them are unwritten languages. So they're things, uh, languages spoken by small communities that, without a, a literary tradition, you know, a linguist or an anthropologist comes in and writes a grammatical description. So what they're actually describing are the patterns found in the spoken language, because there is no written language for these, uh, these languages before the linguist comes in and finds a way to transcribe them. Um, in a language like many of the, the languages with a written tradition, the spoken language is quite different from the written language for historical and political reasons. So, I mean, there may be cases, and I gather that Czech is one of them from what I've been told, that you know, standard written Czech is this completely different thing from colloquial Czech of even the capital city like Prague. So there would be the difference has to do with, you know, real differences in grammar in some cases. Um, and then you would have to analyze it differently, you know, to reflect those real differences 
in grammar, but it would still the same principles would apply about you know what the dependencies are, what the guidelines are for applying them. It, it's just that you know the, the colloquial check analysis might look a little different from the, the standard written check just because they're different varieties, really, different languages. You know. Thank you. I have a question concerning a point that you mentioned at the beginning about the, the principle that uh, helps one distinguish between, uh, between let's say, a, a core argument and, a, and an oblique. You said that there is this, this rule that uh, once the, the, the word is unmarked, it's more likely to be a core argument than an oblique, which I do agree with, of course. I just wonder how you, would you deal with cases where there is basically no marking, like right? you have a language where you have a sentence where no, nothing is marked in any way. So does this apply or do you have to search for other criteria or just uh, you, you cannot apply this, this, uh, this uh, principle? Well, um, the two cases I might be referring to would be you know, languages where there's no case marking on nouns, for example. Um, but most languages, even if they claim that there aren't any adpositions, there are uh, the words that are typical sources of adpositions, like relational nouns like back or behind or face, or serial verbs like you find in Chinese and other languages, words that mean give, but they're used for a dative function, or words for take, and it's used for an instrumental to express an instrument. So I would say in those cases, you should one should annotate, like a give or take, as the the case marking, or I will noun like face or back or whatever. In some Mayan languages, those nouns are used for like dative or beneficiary for face, and then again they should be marked as case. The other type of language you encounter, at least this is the way they're described, is that. Um, there's no marking because the verb has some kind of marking. And this is what typologists call an applicative verb form, where the, essentially the applicative suffix or affix indicates that the so-called object is really the beneficiary or the recipient or the instrument or whatever. But most linguists that analyze those languages would still treat those noun phrases as objects. and it's, they're objects because the verb is in a special form which makes it into a, a grammatical object. So I think those two cases, which are not that common in the world's languages, but they're there, you know, that's how they could be analyzed. And those are the guidelines I'd suggest for core versus oblique annotation of such languages. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, one question on your list of those nine, I guess, categories of modifiers. Uh, there was, I don't think you have to bring it up. Uh, oh, okay, well, go ahead. One of oh. them was uh, articles or determiners for, for yeah, yeah, definiteness. Well, yeah. Okay, so uh, I was wondering uh, whether and where uh, would fit in this in this classification uh, the topic markers in Japanese or, or Tagalog because I've uh, I've seen people classifying them as articles although they don't encode definiteness or not not uh, in the first place but on the other hand I would find them also quite similar to at positions which as function words don't appear here as well uh, uh, um, at all so what would be your well, I would that. definitely code them as you know, indicating some kind of argument dependent of the predicate. Uh, and then the question is for these languages like Japanese, where you you know you distinguish between that and something which we call a subject. Um, now, the facts in Japanese are a bit more complicated. I mean, in, in uh, Chinese, they have constructions that they might call double subject constructions. So. I think there would be a case to consider whether we should have a dependency that's topic that's different from subject. And the catch there is that you would have to um, come up with some semantic or some kind of guidelines to distinguish subject and topic. Um, another solution would be simply to allow a language like Chinese to have two subjects, which a lot of people don't want to do. But then there are also people that 
don't like having two objects, like the English double object construction, but that's much more common, and I think, in my opinion, that's, I would accept having two objects. UD distinguishes between direct and indirect objects, that's another way to do it. So it'd be like having like two subjects, a topical subject and a non-topical subject. It gets kind of weird if you, you do that. So, but I think the short answer is it's definitely a category, of a, a kind of argument dependent, and then the question of whether we create a separate dependency or lump it with subject oh. is. That's actually another question that I would have that you just answered, but my, my original question was whether the word that marks a noun phrase as topic, whether it is something like uh, an article and then possibly fits into the category of modifiers, or whether it's rather just uh, well, an ad position? Well, that's an interesting question because, so in Japanese, typically the core arguments, you replace the uh, ga or o particle with wa. So you just replace it and it makes it look like, oh, we'll just call it a case dependent. But for like with ni, you say ni wa. So you have both of them in there. And so you can call them both case. If you call just ni, which is like the dative locative case, the case, then what do you call wa? But I don't think you'd call, I wouldn't think you'd want to call it some kind of debt or modifier. I mean, I think I'd go with either the two, calling them both case marking and some kind of complex case marking like you get elsewhere. Thanks. Well, I'm afraid that time is just uh, supposed to tell us that we have, unfortunately, to close uh, the session. Um, I would have one very uh, general question, actually, just for confirmation of my understanding of the distinction between um, uh, the constructions and uh, the uh, strategies. Uh, is it, uh, am I right when I see the constructions in your sense as some kind of cognitive patterns? Uh, yeah, yeah. But the constructions would combine, you know, some kind of semantic content and information and packaging. So to give the example of the construction that I introduced here that I feel that we should recognize, the mensural construction is semantic content, some kind of measuring word and the stuff being measured, the entity being measured. But I'd also argue, and this was the, you know, the kind of controversial side of the argument, is that the measure word is the modifier of the object concept or the entity word. So a mensural construction is some kind of measure word and then the, a word denoting the entity being measured where the measure word is functioning as the modifier and the entity word is the head. Then my difficulty would be to see on which categories or which are the cognitive categories I am supposed to build my system on. Well, that's a good question, and that's where I think the answer is an empirical one, because basically what I realized reading the cross-linguistic literature, see, I'm not a specialist in modifier construction. I haven't done any of my own, like, heavy-duty cross-linguistic analysis. I've been relying on other people's work. It's not something I've focused on much. So when I started reading Kovchevskaya Tom and looking at the classifier literature and analyzing classifiers, I came to the conclusion that just by looking at the empirical facts of the grammatical constructions that you find in the world's languages and how peculiar they are for this class that we needed to single out this cognitive category of measure phrases, measure constructions, um, and single it out because it has such unique or distinctive grammatical behavior. The range of variation you find across languages is distinct the distinction between the anchoring and non-anchoring constructions is important. It is already there. It's already necessary for distinguishing uh, possessive constructions from compounds or these binomial naming constructions. So it's like that carried over and convinced me that we need to distinguish this conceptual category. So the point here is that you can't come up with an a priori list of conceptual categories you need to distinguish. You really in an ideal world, you have to look at the facts of the world's languages and see what, what cognitive categories those facts kind of demand that you single out and as separate you know, conceptual categories.
Thank you, thank you very much. I think this brings us back to your question, but we don't, <laughs> we don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so many thanks for your talks, uh, for your talk, many thanks for visiting us, and I do hope we'll have some more opportunities to talk together and uh, at least to read your papers, and we'll, be, uh, we'll see um, uh, the arguments and be more deeply in the, in the argumentation. But I think that the paper was extremely instructive, and thank you very much well, thank for you. that. Thank, thank you, thank you for your patience. I'm also around for a while longer, I mean this, evening, this afternoon, if someone wants to talk about these issues or other issues. So as far as I know, I'm, I don't have any commitments between now and the end, you know, the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you.